Oh, welcome one. Welcome all to the Snail Trail 4x4 podcast. If you like going off-roading in Toyotas, wrenching on Toyotas, camping in Toyotas, and maybe even poking a little bit of fun at Toyotas, and of course, hearing about how fantastic Irish potatoes are in Toyotas, then this is the podcast for you. That's right, ladies and germs. My name is Tyler. Joining me back from the Greenland not to be confused with Greenland, um, is the one and only Jimmy Jet. How are you doing, buddy? I'm good. I'm yeah. I'm still a little jet lagged, but I just woke up, so I think I'm I'm gonna be all right. Nice. Yeah. You seem like you have more energy than I do. So like <laughs> I, I know just... that's kind of funny, huh? <laughs> well, you've been in this constant continuous lack of sleep, and yeah. mine only comes like very rarely. That's what she said too. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we uh-huh. I think we went to bed at like 10 o'clock last night, uh-huh. but it was really like three or 4 a.m. Uh-huh. time for us. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, after two flights that, you know, one from Ireland, we flew from Ireland to Atlanta. It was about eight hours. We had a few hour layover and then we flew from Atlanta to Sacramento and that was about five, four or five hours. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you're just tired of traveling and tired of life and mm-hmm. you're just getting frustrated. Plus we woke up at like six 30 in the morning and it was four or something <laughs> at night, you know, uh-huh. or back in the morning. I mean, when you go to bed, yeah. yeah. When we were, we were many hours over when we should have gone to bed, mm-hmm. but actually it worked out really well. Cause we got, we landed at seven and I said, I'm going to try to stay up like, <laughs> like I would normally you uh-huh. know, till 10, 10 ish. Yeah. And then when I went to bed, you know, I got a solid chunk of sleep and woke up. I woke up early just cause my time, my, my body clocks off. I woke up about six, but I was, I mean, that's a that's good, good chunk of sleep. Uh huh. It's eight so, hours. Yeah. And, uh, so I'm feeling pretty good. I think that doing some, I, I always don't sleep on planes. Uh-huh. I think that's a thing that I've, I've tried to learn throughout my travels and years is that I mean, and depending on when you arrive at your destination, mm-hmm. but usually you're arriving during the day yeah, at some point. And so then you just spend the rest of your time awake until you, wherever you are, it's normal mm-hmm. that time you go to sleep. Yeah. And I, that really sinks my clock onto whatever time zone you're yeah. in. I just can't sleep on planes because yeah. I'm too There's so tall. many fun movies. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that too. I mean, I want to watch, I want to catch up on movie stuff, yeah. but I'm too yeah. tall. I don't really fit in the, the peasant area of planes. And so sure. it's really uncomfortable for me to sit on a plane. <laughs> so. I, I can follow that for sure. And then if somebody tries to lean their seat back in front of me, God forbid, Oh man, I, I end up hate punching that. the back of their headrest all the whole rest I of the know, trip. I know. I actually, I'd never recline my seat because mm-hmm. I hate when people recline their seats. Yeah. And even though it, like I, the catch 22 is when you recline, you're more comfortable. Yeah. I get it. But I'm always like, man, it just sucks yeah. for the person behind you. Yeah. As soon as I see somebody reaching for the recline button, uh-huh. I immediately just dig my knees in the back of their chair. And I've had a couple people like try and recline. They can't because my knees are right there. Yeah. And then they end up turning around and looking and I'm like, yeah, I'm here. And they're like, yeah. oh, sorry. I'm like, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyways, we'll, I'll get into a little Ireland talk. I think that the assistant and I are going to do a dedicated Ireland episode. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll make it a bonus episode of some sort and get, uh, give you guys some information about our trip and our travel and, uh, the fun we had while we we're over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely a green land. Yeah. My gosh, it everywhere you looked. And I don't know if it just is right now or what, but everything was in flower. Yeah. And I don't know if that's just an, like, it's always wet there. So it's always flowering. I think so. Yeah. It's <laughs> just know, a so, moist land. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was absolutely gorgeous over there, but yeah, uh, yeah well, I'll, we'll jump into that in a little bit. Uh, I know that we have some housekeeping that we need to catch up on. Mm-hmm. We eventually need to make this damn wall. So I stop hitting these yeah. plates behind yeah, me. We do. Um, I think that'll be uh, some motivation now that I've, I'm back in town. Um, I okay. can start setting this room up for better film style. Yep. Things. We have a ton of plywood back in the warehouse right now. Perfect. So uh, I think we just need some two by fours. Yeah. Uh, drill the two by fours into the studs here and then put up the plywood. We'll have a, a wall that we can do anything we want on. So yeah, we'll paint it or mm-hmm. I wanted to, I might wrap it in felt. I was thinking uh-huh. about like, or just <laughs> uh-huh. put some sort of sound dampening yeah. up before we throw metal things on the wall. Yeah. Uh, that my, one of my biggest concerns is the audio quality for the podcast when 
we're making a wall out of metal and yeah. just have, you know, the sound I think we bouncing could, around. We could offset it so we can also take kind of two by fours in different lengths and have the the plates sticking out at different distances to help oh. create more of a sound deadening rather than just a metal wall. That might reflection. be interesting too. <laughs> yeah. Visually interesting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, yeah. we're definitely going to, or my goal in the nearish future is to get the podcast video side of things set up mm-hmm. so that we actually look like we know what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, besides that, uh, the uh, listeners know the truth though. Yeah. Right. The, 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 yeah. The, yeah. We don't have any idea what <laughs> nope, we're doing. Nope. <laughs> right. So, uh, let's see. I, we haven't had time to, um, go through the FNGs or birthdays or anything like that. Nah. Uh, so we'll do the giveaway for the EVCX next, uh, Thursday. Mm hmm. We'll get that done. Um, that it's a sweet product from what was stage nine, ultimate nine, ultimate nine mm-hmm. motorsports. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I can't wait to get one on my truck and get that going. Uh, this week's giveaway, we are going to be giving this away month? some this month's. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's not tool <laughs> month anymore. Huh? Not tool month. Yeah. Uh, this month's giveaway for the, what month are we in August, the month of August, uh-huh. we are going to be giving away a, assortment of gear wrench tools. Yeah. We need, uh, we have some gear wrench tools still in the back, um, that we need to give away. We need to get them out of this warehouse. Tyler's, uh, yelling at me for taking storage away from him because he has so much crud (laughs) here in the warehouse. Yeah. And, uh, so my loss is your guys' gain. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, um, some pretty cool stuff. I mean, we got uh, a bunch of, a lot of different things back there. So, um, there's wrench sets, there's more wrench sets. There's, um, I love the night. eye tape yeah. measure still, they're still my favorite tape measures. Yeah. Um, so maybe there, what we could do is, um, maybe we will make like a few hundred ish dollar packages and mm-hmm. the winner gets to choose. Oh, that'd be kind of cool. Want. Yeah. Choose your own adventure. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can do that. So if you guys want a chance at uh, a bunch of gear wrench tools, go to, irate 4 by 4com and go down to the snail trail 4 by 4 forum there and all your options if you're on a computer will be on the right hand side of the snail trail 4 by 4 forum and if you're on mobile they're down at the bottom so just scroll all the way to the bottom and all your sign up options are there um and then let's see what else do we got going on reviews we, reviews we got a bunch mm-hmm. of reviews always coming in mm-hmm. um but if you want to leave us a review what are we coming up on 700 and we're coming up 700. Yep. Yep. So we got episode or a review. Once we get to review number 700, we're giving away a swag pack, mm-hmm. which will have some snail trail four by four gear. It'll have some, uh, more flake gear and it has the elite membership from Onyx off road. Yeah, it does. It's very <laughs> excited to give away that. Mm-hmm. And then when we get to 750 reviews, what are we giving away? A whole set of Yokohama tires. So, uh, and pretty much any tire you want, it's pretty cool, um, for them to offer up that for the listeners and, uh, all you really need is, or all you're limited on is less than a 20 inch wheel and DOT approved compounds. So no sticky compounds, no race compounds, um, which is pretty much their whole off-road line. So it's pretty cool stuff. Um, they're coming out with uh, some new tread designs as well. Um, we might have to see if we can get somebody from Yokohama on to talk about some of the new tires they're coming out with and releasing right now. So, yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, that's at 750 reviews. So just go over to Apple Podcasts, leave a review. Um, if you leave a review now, um, then you'll be entered for the swag pack at 700 and the tire giveaway at 750. Um, and pretty much all the reviews, the giveaways that we do from those, um, we pretty much take all the reviews thus far. So leave a review once and you automatically get entered into multiple giveaways that we decide to do around the reviews. Um, you can also leave multiple reviews if you can find ways to uh, hack into other people's accounts. You just need to remember that you need to be able to prove <laughs> that you have access to that account if you end up winning. Uh, so we have ways of checking that and we will confirm it with you if you're the winner. Um, but it's some pretty cool stuff um, and we're going to keep going. And once we hit 750 reviews, we'll figure out what the next milestone would be and maybe it'll be a thousand from there and we'll do something cool again. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. We'll probably most likely figure out something else yeah. to do for a thousand. 
Um, Absolutely. I did get in a bunch of wood pucks. Oh, They're about great. five, five and a half inch round. Okay. Discs. Um, so um, I just need to create the jig for them and then uh, f- get the design swapped over to the laser and uh, we can start burning more of the treasure hunt tokens. Oh, good. Yeah. So we can get that back up and running again. Yes, that'll mm-hmm. be fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were posting those. Are there probably still, there are still postings of some pucks that are out there in the wild yeah. on irate four by four. Yep. That's uh, where we were posting them. So you need to go on irate four by four, go down to snail Trail four by four podcast under the watch list and discuss section. Mm-hmm. And you need to be a snail squad member to be, see the post. It's a hidden post unless you're a snail squad member. Yeah. Then you will have access to see the coordinates of where the tokens are that are still out in the middle of nowhere. Yep. There's um, a bunch in Moab still that have not been there found. There are. There are yeah. a lot in Moab, and I think there's at least one. I know of one that has not been found here in California in the like Rubicon esque area. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think, well, the one I'm thinking of up in the Rubicon, I think Trevor found. I think he went out on an excursion one day and found it. But there's one um, by. I know we've, we've dropped a few. There's out, one. What is the there. fall? Hidden, not Hidden Falls. The Oh, Bassey Falls? Bassey Falls. There's uh-huh. one by Bassey Falls. Okay. That I don't think anybody's found yet. Okay. Nice. <laughs> So uh, we got that. Uh, hopefully, is going to be up and running soon. Um, I got the finally got the motivation to finalize the Fordyce Trail design. Okay, to burn on to slate uh, trivets essentially. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so twelve inch round slate trivets, um, and we did the Rubicon design on it for uh, RTF. Yep. Um, and now I'm doing the Fordyce design on it for Sierra Trek coming up. Um, so there'll be four of those slate trivets available at Sierra Trek um, for the raffle, the silent auction, um, that kind of stuff there. Okay. Um, but they they turned out really good and I'm excited for them. Um, and now that it's all done and finalized, I think I'm going to put those slate rounds, the slate trivets up on the Morphlight website under the trail fundraiser section. Yeah. Um, with our trash bags. Cool. So okay. uh, and watch then, for that to go live relatively soon. Yeah. And then can we add, also do the same thing, but have the Rubicon one? Absolutely. So yeah, it'll be um, different rounds. So I have uh, Rubicon's done, obviously. Right. Ford Ice is now done. Uh, Barrett Lake, I have pretty much laid out. I just need to clean it up Okay. a little bit, um, but we'll have those three rounds will be the starting three Perfect. trails uh, for the, the fundraiser trivets. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be great. I mm-hmm. think that's a fantastic idea, adding that to the website. Yep. So cool. Yeah, I saw them. They look fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, Going to be good uh, fundraiser opportunities there at Sierra mm-hmm. Trek, which I don't think I'm going to go to this year. You don't think so? I don't know. I'm really, I'm really, I don't think I'm going to go and wheel. If I do go, I might do an overnight Friday night to Saturday. Okay. But I mean, I just, you know, it's just getting home. Today's Wednesday. <laughs> I've got to catch up on work. I've uh-huh. got to, you know, uh, organize my life. The kiddo goes back to school tomorrow. Mm. Like, you know, there's a whole bunch of things happening right now. Mm-hmm. And I, one of the major things that I want to get going is Samantha. Yeah. And so I'm kind of like, well, if I go to, out of town, then I'm not working on the truck. Yep. And so I really want to get working on Samantha. I'm, you know, like I thought I'd have a ton of time during summer, but usually when summer comes around, like the assistant wants to go do things or yeah. the assistant, the mini assistant are not in <laughs> school. So they have free times. They're home all the time. And it's vacation and, time. And Jimmy. I want to go wheeling. <laughs> yeah. Right. And there's all these things that happen during summer that distract me from not letting me be in the shop. Yeah. Where now the, you know, the assistant's not going to go back to school for another week. The mini assistant goes back to school this week. So things are really going to slow down in my life. I fingers crossed mm-hmm. and I'm going to have more time to work on Samantha. Plus, I n- really need to finalize and get out the Land Cruiser panels that I took uh, to Moab. Uh, They're not even up on the website yet. <laughs> um, I've had people asking me about them, and I just need to get the website updated and ready for it. Mm-hmm. And so I have a lot of work things that I just want to get done. And like as much as Sierra Trek is an absolute blast, uh, I just think there's more important things for me to do right now. Yeah. So. Yeah, priorities. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, I don't know. I'm still in limbo. I'm going to talk to the assistant about possibly l- taking the mini assistant to school on Friday morning and then just driving up the hill, hanging out all day f- 
a Friday up there, spend the night, uh, you know, just the rooftop tent, and come park back the Saturday truck somewhere, somewhere. Yeah. And come back in the morning yeah. on Saturday and then spend time with the family over the weekend. Yeah. You know, cause and one of the things, you know, and it, hopefully now, well, to maybe to some, some extent now, you know, you, you have a little understanding, but you know, I haven't seen the mini assistant like almost two weeks. Yeah. And I'm like, I need to see her. I, I miss <laughs> her. And so, you know, being gone the first weekend of us coming home, mm -hmm. you know, to be gone from her, it's a little bizarre as well. So it's like, I want to spend time with the family. Yeah. No, I hear you. It's, it's a weird feeling going from not having kids Yeah. to, and, and your whole life is spent around you and doing stuff that you really want to yeah. go do and experience. Right. And then now you have the kid and you have this draw. You're like, I, I want to actually, it's another, it's, it's a weird, I, it's a, I don't know. It's a weird feeling to me where I'm like, I want to spend time with him and I want to, yeah. I want to see these developmental things that are happening right now. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It's another responsibility. Yeah. Right. True. And it's something that you need to take care of. And, you know, I do feel that every parent needs time away and mm -hmm. every parent needs another hobby besides parenting. <laughs> yes, I agree. Right. They're like, yeah, you know, and it's, not, it's different. I think when the, they're an infant, mm -hmm. right? Like that, the, dedicated to keeping well, that yeah. thing alive. Exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that is, that's the job. Is when it still kids, breathing today? Yeah, oh, we're doing good. But when the kid's 10, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, Hey, yeah, you're hungry. Go make yourself some food. Yeah. Like, it, you can run in the microwave <laughs> uh -huh. and make yourself some mac and cheese. You're yeah. fine. Like yeah. you can handle that, you know, but there are developmental things always happening in their life that is there. But yeah, I think that there's, uh, in regards to parents, I think that every parent needs a hobby besides their kids so mm -hmm. that they're not drowning their kids are not helicopter parents are mm -hmm. not doing other things. So that there's, they get their own personal time. They get, do things that they enjoy. Yeah. Right. And so I think that every parent needs to have that. I know the assistant likes dancing. So mm -hmm. that's one of her hobbies, you know? And so two times a week, she usually is gone at night and she's go, going to dance class and yeah. having fun with the ladies that are at the ballet or at tap or whatever mm -hmm. class she's taking. So it's like, yeah, go, go do something. Yep. Cause I do have friends that, uh, and, I don't know if it's always the case, but in my case, it's usually the mom uh -huh. doesn't like drops their entire life so that they can deal with and be with and raise the children. Yeah. And I don't think that's right. I think that they, I don't think it's should, healthy. I don't think it's healthy. Yeah, I, I think agree. that they lose track of life mm -hmm. in a way. Yep. And and then when the kid graduates and leaves, like what, then what's going to happen, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah, you, okay. You spent 18 years dedicated to this child and now that they're gone, now you don't know what to do with life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that, yeah, every parent needs a hobby. Yep. I agree. That was um, a bird walk. It was, but it's a good <laughs> one. I mean, it's, it's, it's coming from perspective of being a parent. So, yeah. um, I don't know for me, we, uh, for so Sierra Trek, I'm going up Saturday. Okay. Um, taking the kid, Oh. And the secretary. Okay. So both are coming up. Um, and the secretary's best friend is going to oh. be coming with us as well. Oh, cool. Um, and so, uh, they will be camping out Saturday night. So hanging out for the festivities and then going home Sunday morning. I am not bringing the forerunner. Oh, so it's just a camping trip for us and hanging out at Meadow Lake and supporting Cal four. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, um, huh. Yeah, it'll be fun. Um, I've just, I realized from, we took the kid out on the Rubicon mm -hmm. um, yeah. a couple of weeks ago. And as long as we're still moving in the forerunner, it's great. But as soon as we stop for more than 20 seconds, um, he gets fussy, right? And the, the best way to stay stopped on a trail is to go to four dice during Sierra Trek. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, absolutely. I'd, I'm just, I, that's not going to work yeah. out having the kid there. Unless uh, you do some night go, wheeling. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> or go up to Lacey peak or something like right. that's all we do. Um, so we're just not going to do any wheeling. We're going to come up and, uh, enjoy the meadow lake and summit city. Yeah. Um, with everybody. So that'll be fun. And then, uh, the kids started daycare. Oh, while you were gone here. So this Good. week was the first week of daycare. Um, and it's pretty cool. It's, uh, we found a preschool that is first and foremost, they're a preschool, but they have an infant program. Okay, cool. And so they work on, um, developmental processes and, and you know, the, they'll gauge each kid's 
development as they go and they'll yeah. help encourage those fine motor skills, the, the development stuff that they should be getting to, or that they're working on. Um, and so like rolling over, yeah. sitting up on their own, standing up on their own, um, working on balance, mm -hmm. um, and then working on, uh, different textures and touch and feel and observation stuff. Nice. And then they also teach sign language to oh, infants. Perfect. Yeah. 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 So, um, uh, I'm really excited to kind of see how that goes. And he's been in there two days. The first day he was kind of like too much going on yeah. <laughs> overstimulated, yeah. but the second day he fell right in and he was, uh, doing good. So today's the third day and we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Hey, that's uh, good to hear. Yeah. So that means the secretary has some free time Yep. is, and then, uh, so maybe she's going to find a little hobby. Well, she works from home. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah, during the day she's working the whole time and then, but now it's like, she is less likely to get a hobby because, uh, she works during the day, has a bunch of meetings and stuff, yeah. a team she manages. And then at now in the evening, when the kid's back home, she, she, feels just, a she little, just wants to stay with the kid the whole yeah, time. Yeah. Cause she didn't have them all day. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and that's, that is parenting, right? It's yep. like, we're at work all day. And then when we come home, you mm -hmm. know, we, we work with our kids. Yep one way or another. And then maybe after they go to bed, but that's when you stay up. Exactly. The secretary <laughs> goes to bed then too. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, that worked out. So you did, we're going to have a nanny. We were, um, and turns out it was, it was, she was good. Um, the only issue was that she was expensive. She's triple the cost of a daycare. And yeah. so we could only really afford her two days a week, three days a week was pushing the budget. Yeah. Um, and the daycare was less than the nan five, for five days a week. It's less than the nanny two days a week. Wow. Um, and the cool thing about the daycare is uh, with the infant program, you're renting a crib is really what you're doing. Cause there's okay. no crib sharing, right? Sure. Um, and so the concept is you can take the kid over there and pick him up whenever you want between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Oh, and okay. so if you are like, Hey, I'm home for the day. I'm off. I'm not working that day. You can keep the kid and they don't care. <laughs> That's yeah. not a penalty for skipping a day, having an absence or anything. Um, and if you like in the middle of the day, you're like, shit, I have this appointment. I really need to go to, you can drop them off for a couple hours yeah. um, and then pick them up when you're done. Yeah. That's so good. It's just, it's really, really flexible on what it is. And they're teaching him a lot of stuff that as a first time parent, I'm like, I don't know how to do, I don't, yeah. I'm not, I don't, I don't know how to work on baby physical therapy to, to get them to roll yeah. over. Like, yeah. no, do another uh, push up. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> yeah. Do, that's a good push up. Do some more. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's one of those things that it's like, I just, they're, they're, they're professionals and that's why you go to professionals to do stuff because sure. I'm not a professional in that area. Yeah. Um, so well, and they good. can do better than I can. That's a, that. Yeah. I think that's going to be really healthy. Mm -hmm. I think daycares are, you know, a lot of people I think look down onto daycares because then in a way you're not raising the child. Right. But and, I and it's almost, you feel guilty almost. Kind, taking I'm there. sure you do. Yeah. I mean, I never had to, I went to daycare, so I, mm -hmm. I have kind of the opposite um, experience it to some extent, mm -hmm. but I think that daycares are actually really healthy because like in, kind of in your case, I mean, your, your kid's really young, but if you're a, a single kid or a solo kid or, uh, you know, you have no yeah. other brothers and sisters, yep. then you don't really learn how to share. You don't really learn how to work with others. You mm -hmm. don't learn how, like some of the playing things when you're in the younger stages of life. Yeah. You know, it's you, a lot of people, it's like, oh, they're going to pre, uh, P, uh, what pre-K or, uh, -huh. uh, uh Just kindergarten, preschool, preschool, preschool stuff, or yeah. kindergarten. That's the first time they're around kids their age. Yeah. They don't know how to react. They don't <laughs> yeah. know what to do, mm -hmm. you know, plus, you know, uh, there's a lot of learning that goes on at those things. There's a lot of interactions that happen. There's a lot of germ sharing that happens, mm -hmm. which is not like is bad, but is not bad. Yeah. It's good for your immune system to get sick. Yeah. Exactly. You don't want to get deathly ill, but it's good to get sick. <laughs> yeah. And the kids at those ages, their immune system is like the strongest it's ever yeah. <laughs> like, you know, they're going to be beefed up and, you know, mm -hmm. ready to fight whatever comes their way, you yeah. know, cause they're, they're going to be interacting with all these other germ kids yeah. running around. <laughs> um, plus it gives the parents free time, mm -hmm. which every parent needs. Yeah. Uh, so I think daycares are a really good thing. I don't, you know, I don't know why people really look down at them mm -hmm. and to some extent. Um, 
I don't know. I think, you know, parents have got to be parents and parents have got to work mm-hmm. to provide for their family. Yeah. So yeah, you know, my dad worked at Hewlett Packard and worked all, you know, normal shifts. And my mom was a teacher, Yeah. you know, and when I was young, you know, they were both away at work. And mm-hmm. so I had to go to a daycare and mm-hmm. I had some of the, I was a wild child, <laughs> but I had some of the, like, I was told that I had a lot of fun there. Nice. I don't remember those yeah. years, but yeah. yeah. And I think that's maybe another thing. It's like, you don't remember ever going no. there, Yeah, you know? So it's like I, the guilt falls on the parent, yeah. not the child. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Kids are, kids are adaptable, man. Yeah. Uh, I'm amazed at how quickly he adapts to any situation. It's like, we're, we're always really timid about taking him out to public or anything and, or taking him over to see grandma, uh, great grandma or anything like that. And he's, he doesn't care. No, it's us. So we're the ones that are timid about it. Yeah. Like, so we need to get over that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Understood. Yeah. Well, good. I'm happy to hear that. I'm, I'm happy to hear things went well. Yep. So, um, I'm happy to hear the two podcasts that you were able to get out. Yeah. Kudos. Good yeah. job. I'm uh, one. I'm happy you got two co- podcasts <laughs> right. out. Two. They were fantastic episodes. Good it job was, with Ben. It was some really cool content. Like yeah. I was trying to make like kind of a, a list of topics that we might hit on. Yeah. And so I was kind of making it, make up this list. I was like, there's a lot to talk about here with him. Holy crap. Yeah. Um, and so it ended up being a really long episode and I was like, oh, let's just cut it into two episodes. It'll, it'll be work out great. Um, a lot of really good information. Yeah, so. absolutely. There's, there's things happening around this world or around this country, at least that, um, you know, we don't know about mm-hmm. unless we start working with companies like Blue Ribbon Coalition, yep. you know, that are dealing with these things daily mm-hmm. and, you know, doing the fight for us behind our backs and in it's, a way. It's totally like we talk about all the time. The goal, a lot of the goal of off-roaders is to get away from the shit like this. Yeah. We don't want to deal with bureaucratic red bullshit. tape stuff and bullshit. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, we don't want to deal with, uh, people problems and, uh, we are extremely lucky to have the blue ribbon coalition dealing with these problems for us. Yeah. Um, and st- staying on top of all the issues and knowing when things are happening and moving on the right times when things need to be moved on. Um, I, I think, you know, I being dealing with more flight and dealing with, a bunch of groups nationwide to work with trail advocacy stuff. There is no other group in the country that's doing what blue ribbon does. Right. Um, to the, ex- to, I don't want to even say to the extent that blue ribbon does, but like there's nobody that comes close to the level. Yeah. Like Cal four, Cal four wheel is a good organization. They do a really good job at organizing the off-road community but they've kind of fallen off on terms of doing the lobbying side. Yeah. The legislative battles sure. side of, of trail advocacy. Um, and that's, that's what blue ribbon totally focuses right. on. And then we have Corva. We've got in, Corva that which does kind of was doing more of the trail advocacy side, mm-hmm. more legislation kind of things, mm-hmm. which in California worked out kind of well. Cause we had, Cal four wheel and Corva and they kind of were hand in hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that blue ribbon coalition does it, does all that stuff, but they do it nationwide. They're doing it on a federal level. Yeah. Which is pretty rad and impressive to see the impacts that they are able to accomplish. Yeah. Um, cause we're, we're so used to in the off-roading world, um, being just shut down all the time not listen to, um, uh, I don't want to say demean belittled yeah. by, by government agencies. And so it's really impressive to actually see an off-road organization making a difference now and making a big impact with right. government agencies yeah. and, um, and rules sweeping legislation across the country that impacts our trails in this right. hobby. Um, and so, um, I, you know, talking with Ben, I knew a little bit about Chevron deference going into it and then talking with Ben and getting, uh, more of the, what's really going on with Chevron deference. Um, it's a really, really interesting and exciting time for off-roading and outdoor recreation in general in this country right now. Yeah. Um, I, I 100% agree that the big issue with BLM is that it's not elected officials. Yeah. 
It's a Absolutely. government organization. And I never realized this with BLM. Yeah, I didn't. I just always assumed that the, the people that manage and run BLM nationwide are elected officials, but they're not Yeah, at all. Yeah, right, they're um, government appointed. Yeah, they're they're appointed officials. And so it's like there's no way to hold that agency accountable for its decisions and actions and what it does. There's no way to do it. And so it's like that's that's absolutely crazy. Right. <laughs> if you have an organization that is holding public lands in trust for the public but is not held accountable to the public at all for any of their decision making, uh, that's a broken agency that, that I don't know how that exists. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> and so Chevron deference is going to help fix that problem. Um, I'm very weary and concerned about um, putting the power of BLM into Congress now because I have my own, uh, my own trust issues with politicians that yeah. are career politicians and their, their whole, they, it's funny because politicians always go into it with good um, intentions, uh, intentions. And then they get stuck in the process of always having to campaign. You're constantly campaigning, which means you always need money to always be campaigning in order to always continue get reelected so that you can do these good things that you had intentions of. Right. But now your focus is always campaigning, um, constant campaigning. And you're, so you end up just selling your soul because you have to have funds in order to con- I'll always be campaigning to continue to get reelected to do the job that you want to do, but you can't do the job you want to do because you're always campaigning and trying to raise funds. Yeah. Um, and Ben does such a great way of explaining those things. It totally right? does. Yeah. Like yep. we've talked about it before on the podcast, but just listening to him, it's like he really takes this way high 10,000 foot level federal information <laughs> and brings it down to, uh, you know, the layman, totally. AKA me, uh-huh. right. Uh, yeah. Uh, me? For something yeah, I can yeah. understand uh-huh. and get wrap my head around about what he's actually talking about, what they're actually doing. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, those two episodes were top notch. They were tons of information, lots mm-hmm. of stuff happening out there. That's negative and pro for the activities that we enjoy doing, Yep, you know, and I really enjoyed his view on like nature and how yeah. humans are a part of nature. 100%. You know, and we, nature, we've evolved with nature. Nature has evolved with us mm-hmm. there. We, we should be a part of the ecosystem, the sustainable right. ecosystem, not locking people out of nature. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was, that was a, a good view. I never really thought about it. You know, I always mm-hmm. think like I'm entering into nature. Yeah. I'm going off-roading on a trail through nature, mm-hmm. right? Not that I am nature. I am yeah. one with nature. I am mm-hmm. part of this nature, mm-hmm. right? It's like, yeah, that makes that, it makes complete sense. Yeah. And also the explaining the photo side of things with, uh, on BLM and, or the national forest. Yeah. And what's actually happening there. It sounds like that's going to change. I think so. I mean, it only, it only makes sense. It's like, yeah, there's this rule where if you're a commercial like company Mm -hmm. making film, like a movie, then you need this permit. Yeah. But the, the Joe Schmo that can pull out his camera that snaps a photo you know, has to get the same permit. Has to get the same <laughs> permit. The same permitting if process. If he's yeah. going to make any money on that, that yeah. doesn't sound right. Yeah. So that was it. Was good clarification on that. Yeah. For sure. Yep. Um. And that whole that I mean, it makes sense. That whole photography rule is designed to help mitigate any damages of having a massive film crew come in. Yeah. Um. And so by it just doesn't make any sense to have the individual go through that same process because the individual could all is already paying for access into that. We as a society pay already to go and have uh, national forests Correct. and BLM land and all this other stuff, um, public lands we've already paying for it. So having the individual come in to those lands, even if they're not going in to access the lands, they're still paying for it. So they have yeah. every right to enjoy it just as much as we do. Um, so it's a, it's a slippery slope when you start saying, you know, that girl in the bikini eating watermelon down on the beach and filming it for her only fans or something, whatever it is yeah, or just to say TikTok. that she can't do that. Then what's to say that I can't go to the beach and enjoy playing volleyball or something. Yeah. Like it's, 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 it's slippery slope. And that's the, one of the beauties of public lands is that it's open to the public. Yep. 
So absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, awesome stuff with Ben. If you guys did not listen to those two episodes, I highly recommend go back and listen to them. Um, the previous two to this episode, I think yep. it was five twenty four and five twenty five. Yeah, or uh, 20, somewhere around there. 25, 26 or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Um, somewhere around there. So check those know. out. I've been on vacation. I know, right? <laughs> um, yeah, good stuff. A great interview with Ben. Super helpful. Uh, thankful for him to take the time out. We recorded for an hour and a half. At uh, least. Sat down. Um, yeah, two hours. Uh, something yeah. like that. Um, so it was a lot of time. A lot of really good stuff. Um, and uh, we'll continue supporting Blue Ribbon. I think that they're yeah. doing a fantastic job with everything. Yeah, absolutely. Not to mention that if you do, sounds like if you do support Blue Ribbon, then you are covered in national forts to do photography. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> yep. So <laughs> check to that box there off. You, go. you can't bother me anymore. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That was a funny, weird side rule or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Cause. Yeah. yeah that, the injunction that got filed covers all of the Blue Ribbon members. Yep. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Um, so that's cool. The good stuff there. Um, I don't know. I have some things to yeah. kind of report on. I, I got to go down to Jeepers Jamboree. Yeah. I want to hear about that. Maybe at the end, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about Ireland, just mm -hmm. a brief like summary. And then, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if this week will happen. Maybe I'll take the podcasting equipment home and I'll see if I can get the assistant to sit down over uh, some Irish whiskey and uh, we can talk about. Well, an you episode. guys have nine new whiskeys. Yeah. To, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. I read the rules wrong. Oh yeah. On what you, I don't, yeah, it was bizarre. There was something like, I guess we're going in more kind of Irish stuff, but yeah. So we ended up bringing nine Irish bottles of whiskey home <laughs> and uh, I read the Was rules. Was TSA not happy about well, that the rule says, I, I'm pretty sure the rule says you, an individual can bring like seven gallons oh. of liquid. Okay. But there's another rule that says if it's alcohol, if it has a certain proof of alcohol, uh -huh. then you're only allowed like one bottle. Oh. So hard alcohol is like, what? you're only allowed to have one bottle. That seems oh, dumb. It's like few bottles of wine uh -huh. and a more for beer, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. So for like a whiskey, higher proof alcohol, then yeah, yeah it was like one bottle. And we're like, <laughs> uh, I thought it said seven gallons. Yeah. And they're like, no, seven gallons of liquid. I'm like, uh, well, this is this a is liquid. liquid. Yeah. What is they're like, yeah, but it's alcohol. And uh, we're like, yeah, but it's like, what? I don't get it. You yeah. Know, like this says it's a seven gallons of liquid. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a very short, I said, I'm not arguing. Like, you know, the rules, yeah. you're, the, you're the customs person, Yeah. you know, and also interesting. We did customs in Dublin Oh. and we flew out. And when we got to Atlanta, it was just like, we walked off an airplane. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, yeah, I also was not really, but kind of arguing with an Irish person that knows <laughs> the law. And I was yeah. like, but wait, explain. Like it said this, like, mm -hmm. this is what I assumed it as. And it, so then they're like, no, it, it, yes, that's true. But you but have alcohol. A sub yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's okay. a sub rule. And I was like, oh, she's like, missed that one. <laughs> yeah. Missed that one. She's like, so I'll just uh, say you're bringing three and you'll have to write, pay an extra tax for two. Okay. Like, that was nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, I'm happy you looked up the rules. You know, you just didn't get far enough, but you looked up the rules. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so, and it's per individual. So, uh, autumn, And it's individual. So the assistant said that she brought three. Okay. And so, yeah. So that we, we paid for four all in all. Okay. But we, yeah, uh, we brought nine bottles in.
<laughs> in Ireland, I didn't get any food. Okay. Here I got, I've already eaten a lot of food. Today, all ready for the Where are we? Okay. But anyways, uh, yeah, well, I'll talk. At, we'll do a little bit at the end of this episode about mm-hmm. Ireland and the trip I did, and then I'll get the assistant on. Um, yeah, for over, a full recap. For a full recap, and we'll do whiskeys. a full episode, <laughs> um, like of our trip and our travel. And um, the assistant wrote down like daily. Uh, everything we did. And so I'm considering trying to like create that into a small blog. Yeah. And so maybe I'll try to spin like, I don't know. I, I have many ideas about how I could r- play with it, all this information. Uh huh. Um, I think the easiest one, at least for now is just, we'll sit down and write a blog or I'll sit down, we'll do a podcast and then, um, we'll, I'll throw up some blog stuff on a website somewhere. Okay. Somehow. You're going to create a new website or up on uh, Snail Trail 4x4 and have like a... Uh, a personal travels. Yeah. Uh, no, I, don't, I don't know. I have no idea. Okay. I have a... We have our like college group website that was dedicated to traveling yeah. and backpacking and doing outdoor activities that um, I did start originally with for Snail Trail 4x4 and then I moved Snail Trail 4x4 off. So I might consider revamping that and putting the information there. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know where I would put it. Um, ex- exactly. But I, regardless, Snail Trail Four by Four will get a bonus episode in a week or so, maybe one to two weeks, depending on when I can get the assistant to sit down. Nice. And uh, we'll release a full recap of our Irish travels. Sweet. Yep. That'll be fun. So, uh, but well, I'm curious. It sounded like you got super sick. I almost died. Like, <laughs> yeah. I. I. Yeah. It was bad. Um. I, so I went out to Jeepers Jamboree. Yeah. Uh, we partnered up with JJ to, um, do the inflation station after okay. the trip. Right. Yeah. So everybody right. coming out of the Springs and going up Cadillac and out to Homa. Yeah. Um, we set up a, a more flight inflation stuff cool. to help in, inflate everybody coming out. Um, cause they have seven, 800 vehicles yeah. down in the Springs, something like that during Jeepers Jamboree. And so, uh, over half of them, maybe uh, roughly half, maybe a little over half come out to Homa after the event and they need to get aired up and gone um, before the, the whole parking lot becomes a clusterfuck and you can't get <laughs> rigs in and out of there anymore. Sure. Right? So, Absolutely. Um, so do you have like a few stations and then somebody would drive up into that station and then you pull out the Morphlate kit in a way, wrap it around the vehicle you know, ask them pot their hood, Essentially, pot their hood. That was the, the goal yeah. of it was to kind of have a couple parking spaces, but it didn't work out that way until later in the day okay. because there's trailers and other people taking up all the parking spaces there. Yeah. So the nice benefit about more is it's portable. Yes. Right. So, and we we're just told them, Hey, find a spot to park for now and we'll come over to you sure. <laughs> and bring everything up and area up and get you on your way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we did that in the morning time yeah. on Sunday 
Um, and that worked out great. And then by around 11 a.m., 10, 30, 11, enough of the parking lot and trailers were cleared out that we took over an area and had people park near our pop-up tent. Okay, cool. Yeah. I was thinking, um, so did you just have the hose laid on the ground and people like drove over the hose to get there? Or did you pull the hose in every time? It kind of, we, uh, we, for, we had two that stayed out and we just kind of bunched the hose up and then had the, the car nose up to where the hose was and then put the hose down the sides and hooked up to the tires and the wheels. Yeah. I wonder if you should get some of those like drive over things. I had thought like, about it. Yeah. Um, but it was, it just, it'd be more to move if people couldn't yeah. park. We had a few people there that, um, like some gladiators that they just didn't know how to turn their lockers off or something. They couldn't turn yeah. <laughs> in the parking lot. And so, uh, there was a couple people that, uh, were welded or, uh, spooled and they just couldn't turn in the parking lot. So they had to park one direction rather than the way we had things set up. So, uh, yeah. Um, it worked out great having cool. the hoses the way they are. Cause I mean, the hoses, they don't kink and they don't hold memory. So you can right. just throw them back into a pile and, yeah. um, put them back out on the vehicle. Once you get a vehicle parked there. So. Yeah, absolutely. And as you, you could drive over them, but you probably don't want to, you know, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's the hose itself doesn't matter, but like some of the fittings, like the T, as long as the T is flat, it shouldn't matter. But the air chucks, you don't want to drive over the air chucks. Yeah. You'll, you, I yeah. guess we haven't done drive over tests on the air checks to see how they, how much they can withstand. But yeah. um, I just think, you yeah. know, it, I've driven over garden hoses, Yeah, which aren't, I mean, I, yours are, yours are beefier than a garden hose, yeah. but a garden hose fine, mm-hmm. but you do it like a bunch of times <laughs> yeah. and then you break down the garden. Hose, yeah. Right. And so I only envision that in a way the same with any hose yeah. out there. It's like, yeah, you could do it. Yeah. Don't do it is probably safer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we ended up airing up in, uh, th- I'm guessing three to 400 vehicles. Wow. Yeah. Did you have a problem with uh duty cycle on compressors? Uh, surprisingly not until we hit, no, there was a big streak of vehicles, maybe 200, 250 vehicles between like 8am and 10am. Yeah. Um, and during that streak, we had a little bit of an issue cause we only brought four compressors out. Sure. And so it took about uh, an hour and a half, two hours before we started hitting the thermal cutoff on the compressors. So we found out that was about 12 vehicles. Okay. Um, 12 vehicles in order to start hitting the duty cycles on the compressors. Right. Which is impressive. I, yeah. It's, uh, to do 12 vehicles before the compressors are like, nope, we need to cool down. <laughs> I thought it was really impressive. I was like, man, that's more. Cause we had estimated it originally at about nine. Yeah. Like the duty cycle for the compressors, we have them listed at about 45 minutes runtime. Um, and so if you're taking a four minute break, five minute break between vehicles, as you're moving one vehicle out, moving the next one in, setting up the hoses, um, you can go for about an hour and a half, two hours yeah. <laughs> on the compressors. And the problem is just the compressor cooling down. Yeah. It's not a duty cycle problem. It's just, well, that, that's duty cycle. Is um, yeah, for most compressors is because okay. that's the number reason number one reason why compressors fail is due to the heat okay generated from a piston style compressor. Right. Um so the duty cycle is there to allow compressors to cool down yeah. and dissipate that heat. Right. So understood. Typically the longer the duty cycle is, the better the compressor is at dissipating heat during its runtime. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, definitely. So all right. So learned a little bit, maybe take a few extra compressors next time. Mm-hmm. One more. It sounds like maybe I think if we had, so if we're doing, uh, if really we needed more stations, I think six stations would have been better for that. Cause just that, that two hours when it was super busy, um, it would have helped just get people through a lot quicker. So I think if we take eight compressors, um, for a big event like that, 800 vehicles is potential, right. Um, is what we'll be doing next time. Yeah. So nice. Yeah. But so what happened to you? I died. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I went in, I went up Saturday morning. Yeah. Um, and then my goal was to go and wheel down to the Springs, hang out in the Springs, see what Jeepers Jamboree in the Springs is all about. Um, and then, uh, right before dinner, as they're starting and serving dinner, I'd wheel back out and then come back up to the Tahoma staging area, make myself dinner. So I had to the employees, um, and then sleep at staging um, and then get up early morning Sunday and start working. Sure. Um, Saturday I had, I stopped at a Starbucks on the way up there. Yeah. 
and I got my coffee and I got two breakfast sandwiches for the trip. One to eat then for breakfast and then one that I threw in the fridge um, to kind of have for snack lunch later. Um, I also stopped at the Chevron Fresh Pond and got some deli sandwich and some other drinks. But the only thing I had eaten um, up until lunchtime was that breakfast sandwich. Okay. And um, I was already feeling a little off. Like I, and I, I just thought it was for some reason, you know, I haven't been doing a lot of hiking. I haven't been doing a lot of outdoor stuff this year um, because I've been sitting at home yeah. all the time work, watching this kid. And I just thought maybe my body isn't as adjusted to elevation anymore as it was. And so I was like, okay, it just kind of feels like I'm, I'm short on oxygen. Like my body's struggling a little bit and I don't have the energy in my muscles. Like yeah. you have lactic acid build up in your muscles, right? In your body. Yeah. That's kind of how it felt in, okay. during the morning time as I was kind of walking around the Springs and saying hi to people. Um, and then I was like, maybe I'm just hungry. Maybe I just need some food. So I went back to my, the car, grabbed the other breakfast sandwich out of the fridge and had that while I hiked down to the slabs to see what was going down at the river Okay. and the slabs and the festivities down there. And, um, I got down there and I was like, man, I'm really, I'm just, I'm feeling a little lightheaded. I'm, but it's not like anything alarming. It's just, I don't, I'm usually pretty good about knowing when my body is not happy. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of made my rounds, walked around the spring, said hi to a bunch of people. And then I saw Kevin pool. Okay. With a uh, Chris Silvera, a Cal four board member. Um, and they were hanging out. So I went up and hung out with them and within about five minutes of sitting down, hanging out with uh, Kevin and Chris, I got really lightheaded and I was like, I'm going to pass out. Like uh, I'm getting to the blackout stage. Yeah. And so I just kind of stopped them in the middle of talking. I was like, I'm going to lay down on the ground real quick. I, and they're like, are you okay? And I was like, I feel like I'm going to pass out, but I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to get horizontal here. <laughs> my, I know my, my brain is telling my body that I need to lay down for some reason. Um, so I laid down, um, and it kind of took a little bit to, for everything to come back. And I was like, okay, I feel fine. Then I started getting this feeling like I was going to throw up and I was like, that's weird. I just, I don't know. Maybe I'm just dehydrated. I know that I I'm always on the verge of dehydration. <laughs> yeah. So, everybody is. Um, and I was like, so I just downed some water. Um, he had, Kevin had a, um, like drip drop. Yeah, but uh, it's a liquid, else, IV, a liquid IV stuff, a hydration pack. I, yeah, so I put that in a water bottle, had some of that, and I was feeling a lot better. So I was like, okay, I'm, I think I'm just dehydrated. Like I just need to down some more water. I'll be good. Um, I was feeling great, uh, a lot better than I just was um, after sitting there. And so I hung out with them for about an hour, and then I was like, okay, let's get up and I'll start working my way back into camp and uh, see if I can find you know Bob Sweeney yeah. and um, some of the other big names I need still need to shake hands with. Um, and so I went back into camp and I found Dave McKinney. Okay. And he was doing the bourbon tasting. Oh. Uh, for the the um, soldiers. Um, what's the name of that company now? Oh my god, I'm blanking. The Lead Slingers. <sighs> no, it's a it's something soldiers. Um, they a uh, whiskey company, bourbon company. Um, and they do some awesome whiskeys. Everything is 100% USA made. The bottles, the wow. whiskey, everything. Um, and it's really good stuff. Um, and these, it has a, they have a really great story. They are, um, like, so oh, the 12 soldiers, yeah. the horsemen. Yes. That's whiskey. 12 yeah. Horse soldiers. That's something like horse. Oh, Dave's going to call and he's going to yell at me. <laughs> um, anyways, they do some amazing whiskeys and he did a whiskey tasting. So I had in total, maybe half a shot of whiskey. Okay. Um, and then I was feeling like, man, this whiskey is not settling well in my stomach. Like something, something's not right. Yeah. And so right around that time, they were getting ready to call the dinner bell. And I was like, I'll oh, just, let's just more start working my way back up to staging up to Tahoma. Um, so I got in the forerunner and uh, first off driving through Jeepers Jamboree with a neon green digital camo forerunner was hilarious. <laughs> Everybody stopped what they were doing. It was looking yeah. at me. Um, I did have a few people stop and because we had a booth set up during vendor time. Okay. Down there. Ozzy was down there um, the whole week for Jeepers Jamboree. So he had a booth set up during vendor time. Um, so I had four or five people stop me driving through the Springs to be like, Oh my God, 
you guys, you're, you're here. Did you bring product with you too? Cause I saw the stuff in your vendor booth and he said that we might have products. Sorry. Did you bring it with you? And I was like, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> There's just, it's just too much of a logistical nightmare to get product down into the Springs um, for people to buy. So I was like, sorry, just go to the website. We may set up a discount code for you guys. Um, once you get out of here, go buy some stuff at a nice discount for all the JJ participants. Um, I was, as I was driving through the Springs light bright was walking the, the driving path. Oh yeah. Um, and so I ended up making it into a light bright video. <laughs> um, and it was funny because as they were filming, uh, me coming through driving by, I had to climb a ledge at the same time. Yeah. And so I was kind of talking to them while I was climbing the ledge and I stalled the truck out. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, can you guys like to just cut that? Don't put that in. She was like, yeah, don't worry. We'll cut it. I was like, thank you. <laughs> and they did. So, um, it was yeah. fun seeing them. The Campbells were there. They're really nice. Yeah. Brittany and Kevin, Kevin. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. They're really good people. I agree. Um, so super friendly. Um, the Campbells were there. Oh, wow. Um, so okay. I said hi to Bailey. She happened to be walking by the path as I was driving by. And so I stopped. I was like, Bailey, I see you. I'm a big fan. She was like, okay, cool. I <laughs> like, I hi, I'm going to go back to my family. And I was yeah. like, okay, sorry, bye. Um, saw them. The John Webb was there. Oh, so that was cool to meet him. I hadn't met him before. And what was fun was um, he was there with the Synergy suspension guys. Okay. And they had a huge, uh, it was like a dual cab long bed, like F two fifty. It was, I think it was a, a GMC of some kind. I don't remember what kind of truck it was, but it was wrapped in the synergy wrap. Wow. It was beat to hell. There was no sliders on the truck and all of the rocker panels were completely dented in. I was like, do the doors still open on that? They're like define open. <laughs> it was a dual cab long bed. It, I think it was, it's a Ram. It might be a Ram. Yeah. yeah. Um, they, yeah, I've seen videos of them just destroying that thing. <laughs> they destroyed it. Um, and anyway, so they stopped me because, um, I've been wheeling with one of the synergy guys on the RTF granite loop. Uh, and so I got to know him on that granite loop. Um, and so we hit it off immediately. He's got a really nice kind of truggy Toyota. Um, and so I was chatting with him. He noticed and stopped me as we were chatting. And there was this guy with him that was also chatting. And the guy was like, dude, this is really rad. The suspension. He goes, I have a third gen forerunner that I've been trying to figure out what to do with. And I was like, hit up four wheel underground. Yeah. They have some awesome, the, all the suspension that you see here is four wheel underground. So he was looking at this is really rad. He goes, what'd you do with these axles? So we're talking about the axles and blah, yeah. blah. And the, the synergy guy goes, Oh yeah, no, this is, you know, he's definitely knows this stuff. He knows how to drive. He drove a lot of the Ram through here, the truck up here. And I was like, I don't know if that you could, that thing's pretty beat up and he yeah. goes, you should, uh, the four wheel drive isn't working. So and I was like, Oh, oh. shit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. More kudos to you then. Um, like, yeah, he's finished third in ultra and uh, King of the hammers and stuff. And I'm like, I don't know who this guy is. I'm like somebody yeah. who finished third. I would know who they are. And so I just assumed it was like a 4,500 class or 4,600 class or That's something funny. Yeah. Or a side uh -huh. by a golf cart race or something. I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. And then he said it again and he said it like a third time by the third time he had said it. I was like, okay, what? I was like, what class are you finishing third in? He goes 4,400. I was like, who are you? <laughs> what's your, what's your name? He goes, Oh, I'm, I'm John Webb. I'm the guy that drives around with the music. I was like, Oh my God, you're John Webb. <laughs> so we've been sitting there for like half an hour talking, yeah. um, super chill, super cool dude. Um, I just, I, and you would, you would think because of how he's the guy that drives around with the music blaring the whole time, right? Yeah, he's yeah. a fun dude. And he's, he definitely is a fun dude. I super wonder chill. if he's from the Cal Poly area. Um, I want to say he's from the, <sighs> Bay area yeah. question mark. I'm not sure. Um, I didn't ask him about that, but, um, yeah, so it was fun meeting John. Yeah. Um, and just geeking out over off-road stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> Meathead gearhead stuff. So, um, with him for a bit. Um, anyway, so that was the driving through the Springs with the forerunner, having a good time with everybody. Uh, I got to see a lot of people. I knew the gen right guys. I ran into them, all the metal cloak guys yep. got to see them. Um, Dave Rubicon, all the Rubicon trail adventure guys got to see them. Um, so it was just fun to be down there and see my people. Right. Yeah. After not really getting to go out and do much wheeling this sure. year. Um, so anyways, I'm heading back up Cadillac. And, um, I turned the air conditioning off. So first off the forerunner did fine and I pushed it. 
I pushed the engine, I would say, coming in from staging to get down to the springs. I made it from staging to observation in 42 minutes. Wow. Um, so the, the four wheel underground suspension is doing awesome. Yeah. Um, it was great going through there. Um, and I really wanted to try and push the engine to see if I can get it to overheat. Sure. Never did. Mm. Never went above half on the overheat on the, the temperature gauges. Um, okay. Which is about two Oh five two ten. So it's a little warm for the three, four, the three, four really likes to be around 190, 195 is what thermostat is, but two Oh five two ten is not. Yeah. Nothing of fine. concern yeah. for engines. Um, so it didn't overheat there. And then, um, it didn't overheat coming up Cadillac with the AC off. Um, and, but by the time I got to observation, I was not feeling good at all. Like I was feeling woozy. Like I was getting to the point you get that, that excess saliva buildup yeah. from feeling like you're going to do your throwing up is intimate is yeah. intimate, imminent. Um, and I was like, I man, I am lightheaded. I am super dizzy. I'm going to throw up. I was like, I don't know what's going on. And so I just kind of hung out at observation for a little bit. Cause I was like, I don't want to have to throw up while I'm in the middle of driving. Yeah. So I hung out at observation for about 20 minutes. Um, I threw up yeah. <laughs> at observation. I was like, all right, I need to get moving now because I knew it was bad. Cause typically when, once you throw up, you start feeling a little better. Yeah. Your body got something out that was not supposed to be in there. Right. I felt worse. After oh. throwing up, and I was like, "This yeah. isn't good. Something's going on now. I know something bad is happening. I don't know what it is, but it's not good." Um, and so I was like, "Let's just get moving. Let's see how far I get before the next <laughs> wave comes over me." Um, and I made it all the way out to um, where the 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 road down to observation meets the the forest road that yeah, goes out main, to staging, the, yeah, sure. right? So pretty much where the Rubicon bypass is going to happen. Pretty much right around there. Yep. Um, made it out to there. And I was like, I am, I'm feel, I'm getting tunnel visioned. I am getting really lightheaded. Like I am going to pass out kind of thing. Yeah. And so I got out and I just, I was like, maybe I need some cold air. Cause it was getting cold at that point. Sun's down. Uh, so I got out and I'm sitting there by the rig and I'm just, I'm not feeling good. I'm leaning over the front bumper waiting for, to throw up again and a rig comes through and they're like, Hey, is uh everything good? And I'm like, I, I can't, I was like having trouble talking. Yeah. And I remember everything and it, it, it felt like I was really, really drunk, like to the point of blackout drunk. Right. Yeah. But I was super cognizant of everything going on. Yeah. Um, and I remember telling them, I, I not sure. And they were like, well, what's wrong with the rig? And I was like, no, nothing. Rig's fine. It's me. And they're like, are what, are you okay? And I was like, honestly, I don't know. And they're like, is there anything we can get you? And I was like, I think I can pull it together. Um, however, I have my employees are camping at staging. So on your way out, if you see some guys with a, a, a propane fire pit, looks like they're out camping, should be the only guys camping at staging right now. Um, just tell them that if I'm not to them by nine 30 to come looking for me. And they were like, okay, do you want to ride out or something? I was like, no, I don't want to leave the rig. Um, I was like, I, and they're like, you don't seem all together. Like, yeah. with it, cause I couldn't put together the sentence to talk to them. And, um, and they were like, okay, well, we'll, we'll tell them. I said, okay, thanks. Um, and then I threw up two more times there. Um, and then I had to go take a shit as well. Oh, dang. So I had it, I had, uh, I had liquid coming out both ends. Yeah. Um, so luckily I had my new packed shovel. Okay. Um, the the yeah, company perfect. that we were talking about yeah. that, uh, is working on some really cool stuff in Colorado, doing some really neat studies in Colorado. I had that with me. So I dug a hole real quick and then put a couple of the fungus things in there to, um, neutralize the, the human waste. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, after that, I was feeling a little bit better, but like my, my stomach was feeling a little better, but I was still like tunnel visioning. Yeah. 
And so I got back in the rig and my drove. stomach is getting like queasy just listening to Dude, you talk about was, this because I know the exact sensation, the feel. Oh. I think a lot of us, most people have probably had some sort of food poisoning. It sounds like what's going on yeah, at some I point don't, in their life. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had food poisoning before. I don't know. Not oh. to this extent. Oh, yeah. Well. I've never felt like this before. Um, and when I've been that drunk, I don't remember feeling like that. So like <laughs> yeah. being very vivid of uh, being knowing and feeling everything going on, remembering it all. Yeah. That was very, I've never had that happen before. Yeah. Um, I mean, your stomach is just cramping, oh, you know, man. you're not feeling good. You're just, you're getting hot, hot mm -hmm. sweats yep. and cold uh -huh. chills all at yep. the same time. Yep. You literally just want to like get into bed and get into a fetal position yes. at that point yep. in your life. Yeah. <laughs> and and you can't cause you're, you're in the well, middle of nowhere. Yeah, you happen to be in the middle of nowhere. I, yeah. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm like, okay, what emergency communication stuff do I have with me right now to be able to make a call out to somebody if I need yeah. help? Yeah. Like I was getting to that point. I've, uh, partied really hard one time in uh, Yosemite mm -hmm. and I had to be home. Uh, this is when I was coaching swimming. I had to be home the next day for the most part, uh, to coach. Uh, like, I don't know if I had to get home for a swim meet or for just coaching. Uh -huh. And so I woke up early in the morning and I drove out and I drove like five minutes and I had to pull over and throw up. Yeah. And then I drove like five more minutes and I had to pull over and throw up. And it wasn't because of the, um, because I was partying all night mm -hmm. I had, I got a, a, stomach bug or yeah. some sort of food poisoning. So I had been on like trying to get somewhere because I had to like to do something, uh -huh. you know, uh, to, and I'm driving down the road and eventually I just had to call the head coach and be like, I'm, I'm still two hours away and I have food poisoning I'm trying to get there. <laughs> and, but I think I'm, by the time I get there, you're not going to want me there. Yeah. And he's like, no, we got you. We got, we'll cover it. Don't worry. You know, and I'm <laughs> yeah. like, I am so sorry. Like, th yeah, this sucks, but yeah, it's food poisoning. Like on the road, food poisoning. Dude. I had to pull over and just sleep yeah. for like an hour. Yeah. You know, and I thought was, about doing that too, but I also was like, I don't want a search and rescue thing to come out if I can avoid it just because yeah. I'm sleeping there in the rig or something. But at the same time, like I was feeling bad enough when I had, I was losing enough hydration, enough fluids I was like, this could be a major, major concern right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's unfolding. Um, so I just, I took it really slow. I just remember I was tunnel visioning and all I could see was the, what was dead center of my headlights. Yeah. Um, I had no clue what was going on outside of that. And I could just remember just over and over in my head saying, just go around the next corner. Yeah. Get around the next corner. Yeah. Get around the next corner. And I wasn't going fast. So in, in comparison, it took me 42 minutes to get from staging to observation to get from observation back to staging was three and a half hours. Dang. Um, that's how just out of it I was and just going really slow and just next corner, yeah. next corner, um, finally made it out and I pull into the staging and, um, the employees are there and Ben came over and, um, goes up to the window and he starts saying something and then he just stops dead sentence and goes, are you okay? And I just, I remember closing my eyes and saying, no, I need help. Um, and he goes, what do you need? What do you need? And I was like, we need to, uh, we need to move the truck and trailer. We need to get the forerunner parked somewhere. We need to, um, f make sure that we have everything set ready for tomorrow and like I listed off these five things that needed to get done and who was going to do them. <laughs> and I was like, Ben, I want you moving the truck and trailer. Sean, I want you moving the forerunner. Uh, Jake and Zeke, you make sure everything's staged and ready. Um, Cause I had all the product in the Lance. Yeah. And I was like, that all needs to come out of the Lance because I am not getting up in the morning. I know that right now. <laughs> so you guys need to get everything out right now and have, make sure you have it all ready. Um, and so they immediately, they kicked ass, they took care of everything. And I literally crawled into bed, um, fully clothed with my jacket. And like, I couldn't self-regulate my body temperature and yes. even being under the covers and everything, I was freezing cold, shivering and sweating and sweating at, at the, the same, same time. time. I know I know exactly oh what my I God. It's so bad. It sucks. So it was, yeah. it was terrible. I had a massive headache. I was super dizzy. The world wouldn't stop spinning. I was like, 
I mean, I've, I've been this drunk before, but I know I'm not drunk. Right. Cause I, I have, I'm perfectly aware of everything going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've had, you know, it's like, <laughs> and you, I had you, half an ounce half of whiskey, an ounce of whiskey, whiskey like, the whole day. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I ended up throwing up three or four more times. Um, before I remember once I got it out of my system, I immediately felt better and it was just like, okay, whatever was in my system is out now. And now I just need to sleep and get warm. Yeah. That's all it was. And rehydrate. And rehydrate. So, um, I woke up in the morning at some point and took and went to pee and it was like a dark, dark Brown. <laughs> yes. And I was like, Oh, either Mike, I'm going into kidney failure <laughs> or that's just really how dehydrated I am. And it really was how dehydrated I was. Um, and so I got, I downed a bottle and a half of fluids and then went back to sleep. And I think I finally woke up and got up for the day around 11 AM. Wow. And went over and talked to the employees. They're like, we, we, we thought you were just in there dead. Like we didn't, we didn't want to go and wake you up cause we knew you needed to sleep, but also you weren't coming out. So we thought you were dead. <laughs> I was like, I felt dead. Like, yeah. Um, but uh. Uh, progressively as the day went on Sunday, I got better and better. Um, just getting more fluid in me throughout the day. So Dang. I've, that I've never ever been to that point before. Yeah. And, and no it, fireball involved. No fireball. No, <laughs> no real drinking. I had a simply lemonade for lunch, which is a 5% yeah. alcohol. Like it's, uh, yeah. And, and the half a shot of whiskey. Yeah. So I was like, it wasn't alcohol. It yep. had to have been something else. And the yes. only thing I ate that day was those breakfast sandwiches from Starbucks. Yeah. So yeah, some, <laughs> I mean, I don't, uh, what am I trying to say here? Food goes through your body at different rates. So sometimes, yeah. you know, it's like, what did I just eat? That is causing me the problem is not always exactly the case, yeah. right? It could have been what you had for dinner the night before. And yeah. then when you woke up and your metabolism started and everything started working, then you it digesting. Mm -hmm. But you know, if most likely what you had for dinner last night is also what the secretary had for dinner yep. the, that night. And if she's not getting sick, mm -hmm. then yeah, you could probably put the default onto a random Starbucks thing. Yeah. So, um, you should have been like your buddy in college or whatever that called Taco Bell back. And then <laughs> yeah. <he's> like, <laughs> hey, yeah. you gave me food poisoning. Give me more food. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I need, uh, I need a $50 gift card, please. Yeah. Yeah. But well, damn dude. Yeah. I'm sorry that happens. That sucks. I, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us have had food poisoning in our life and I definitely have. Mm -hmm. And I know every sensation that you just described and I don't want to relive it. Dude, it was, I've, I don't, I, I don't remember ever having food poisoning then. Cause yeah. I, I've never been like that before yeah. in my life. I mean, that's the only thing I could yeah. think it, it was to some extent. And so did, uh, Ryan, uh, MF Ryan, mm -hmm. uh, said he wasn't feeling good today. Oh, okay. Uh, that he was up all night having problems too. Well, Jeepers Chambry was last weekend. Oh, so it's two true. weekends so ago. Probably not thing. related. Yeah. yeah. All right. Plus, well then, Ryan, plus Ryan's messed up other, in yeah. other ways. Yeah. So he has um, the same uh, esophagus issue that Hussman has. Yeah. So every once in a while, he just can't eat. Yep. And uh, he feels shitty for two or three days. Yep. Um, but Ryan that weekend got to go out to the Funny Car Nationals. Oh, that's out, right. Out at Sonoma. Yeah. And so he got some really cool videos of uh, funny cars. Dude. Oh my God. The, that <laughs> Did he tell you the sensation you feel in your chest? Yeah. When they are just mm -hmm. idling? Mm -hmm. Like it's unreal. It's crazy. And then the, the fuel is like pure alcohol. Yeah. And so um, the exhaust just immediately makes you tear up if you're anywhere near the exhaust oh, system sure. of those cars. And like he said that um, they were in the, because uh, I got tickets to go for um, from our DHL rep for more flight. Um, and so we got pit passes. Cool. And so Ryan got to go since we were all up at Jeepers Jamboree. And, um, so he got to be down there in the pits when they're starting up and, and test running and to make sure that the pistons and everything are seated because they swap every piston out, every, every bearing out in an engine in yeah. between the runs. Yeah. And so they do a, a, a warm up run where they run the engine for, I think like 40 seconds. Oh, something like that. Before the, it does the race. Before the race. 
And, um, and so Ryan was standing right behind the car as they fired it up the first time and let it kind of seat the piston rings and everything. Yeah. In. Did he shat himself? Um, no, but he said that he was sitting there and, um, there was four or five guys standing there recording. And by the time, like the exhaust cloud was getting to them, like three of the guys dipped out and ran away, like coughing and, and Ryan goes, I was crying. I was tearing up. And like, I was like, man, I'm being a pussy right now. Like what is it? <laughs> and then, um, after they kind of shut the engines off, he looked around and everybody else right there was oh, just tears rolling down their face. <laughs> and then there's a one old dude that's been doing this for 50 years. Yeah. That's just sitting there. Like there's no problem. Nothing, <laughs> nothing's yeah, wrong. Right. <laughs> His body's used to it. So um, yeah, he got to go and watch the funny cars at the nationals, the NHRHA nationals at Sonoma raceway Yeah, that weekend. He That's said rad. it was really, really cool. Yeah, I bet. I wonder if they could use some duos and just like to equalize the pressure in those two rear, t- rear tires or anything. It's there was, there was some conversations happened at that event. Like I totally was just sending him out there. Cause I was like, that's a rad thing to do. And yeah. I like to let the employees do some cool stuff every once in a while. Um, and he ended up working some connections with people that are interested in tire management systems. Cool. So we'll see what comes of that. Well, uh, that might have some fun, really cool announcements on the more flight side of stuff in the near future. That'd be fun. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, but yeah, that was the, the weekend, the wheeling. Yeah. Um, I then also set up the repeaters for Sierra Trek. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I got to go up and, um, rattlesnake road is closed right now. Um, the new contractor that PG and E got to work on the Fort ice Lake dam, um, is starting this year. So as of now, as of, I think it was back in April or may rattlesnake road, which goes up, um, to Fort ice Lake and then kind of goes down for committee crossing. Yeah. It's the access point for committee on Fort ice is closed through 2028 Dang. four years. Okay. So, so committee is closed for four years. Committee crossing at is this closed. point. Yep. Okay. Um, and so for Sierra Trek, we get a special use permit for Rattlesnake Road for emergencies. Yep. Um, so I got to go and have access to Rattlesnake um to go set up the emergency comms for the event. Cool. Um, but I took the forerunner because I wasn't sure if they were gonna let me get through the gate. Yeah. And I was wondering if I was gonna have to go up Signal Peak and then come around the back way. <laughs> yeah. Into uh, Rattlesnake Road. Um, but I made it through just fine. But the cool thing was that the forerunner never once the whole day thought about overheating hmm. AC on I had AC on the whole time. So driving up the freeway, um, going up the highway, 80 grades, that blue Canyon grade, which is pretty gnarly. Um, forerunner didn't care at all. So it's an airflow issue. Um, cause when you're on the highway percent, or you're yep. moving down rattlesnake road, you've got some speed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's an airflow, which is interesting though. Cause, uh, it also goes to prove that electric fans inhibit airflow at highway speeds. At okay. least if you don't have a high enough airflow electric fan, sure. It kind of creates a, um, um, uh, an air bubble there where f- airflow can't get through your radiator. Yeah. Um, cause it restricts the airflow to only 2,500 CFM, right. whereas it could, it's a lot higher at highway speeds. Yeah. Um, when I was, so we had a six hour layover in Atlanta on the way to Ireland. Mm hmm. And, um, Ryan from big city off road, who's a land cruiser guy, a follower of snail trail four by four follower of cruisers and camp. I think that's sort of how we uh, got to meet each other. Okay. Uh, picked me up at the airport, picked us oh. up at the airport and took us out into Atlanta. Oh, cool. And we were talking about your overheating problem. And he mm-hmm. said something that I've never thought about. He's like, why don't you get a push pull fan, yeah. a, a fan that also pushes air through the radiator or and or condenser. And then, um, your pull fan that's pulling more through so you can get mm-hmm. kind of double or forced air going through. Yeah. So that was a kind of clever idea. There was a lot of people that gave me that. Um, and the problem with that is it still comes down to airflow yeah. and you really just need a badass electric fan. Um, and so it seems like the own, the fans that typically work really well are SPAL fans, S P A L S. Okay. Um, Spall makes some badass electric fans and that's what all aftermarket race cars pretty much use. Got it. Trophy trucks are using them. Ultra yeah. four cars are using them for all the really high output LS motors that everybody's doing. Um, so the, but they're $500 per fan. Yeah. And I'm like, and I would need two minimum. Okay. Um, so I've, uh, the, and so if you get anything less than that, like you really, 
The I also learned that um, the three four engines had a much bigger radiator than the three O's did. Okay. And one of the reasons why the three O's were popping head gaskets so much is because they had an underrated cooling system for that engine. Sure. Um, and so I didn't realize how much bigger those radiators were. I thought they were, I knew they were bigger, but I thought they were like maybe an inch taller or something. Sure. Two inches taller, like not, not that much bigger. Okay. I ordered a three, four shroud so that I could match it to my three, four mechanical fan and then just build custom mounting brackets to my radiator. It is like 40% bigger than the three O radiator. Holy cow. It's massive. Okay. And so, um, I'm like, Oh, the, the three, four radiators really are that much bigger. Sure. So I think that that is, um, uh, 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 one of the culprits, the biggest culprit, honestly. Um, but the problem is that I can't fit a three, four radiator into my forerunner. Yeah. Because of the frame rails, right? The third gen for forerunner frame rails and the first gen taco frame rails, the three, four platforms are much wider in the engine compartment. Okay. Then the second gens are. Yeah. Um, and it's mainly to fit those bigger radiators in there. Wow. I wonder if you can get more cores. Like you have dual radiators or. <laughs> well, that would might work. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's not a half bad idea, right? but um, yeah. I, would, I mean, do you have a four core in there now or just a, yeah. yeah. So I wonder if they make like a five or six core, like, cause the deeper the volume thicker. is one way or the other, right? Like, yeah, there's, you can get more volume by having a bigger square foot, mm -hmm. like, or you can get volume by having a deeper radiator. Yeah. I mean, really it comes down to a surface area of airflow. Sure. And that's the point of having more cores in tech. In theory, you get more surface area for the fluid to get air current to pull the heat off of the fluid. Right. right. Um, and so that three, four radiator is, has a lot more surface area than a three O radiator. Um, however, so with my electric fans that I had, it was about a 2,500 CFM electric fan. Mm -hmm. If you get a push electric fan, it would help at crawling speeds, Yeah, but at highway speeds, you're still getting way more airflow having a highway just air push. going, pushing through your radiator from the movement of the vehicle yeah. than those electric fans can provide. Right. So in order to get a push pull system that worked, I would still have to end up going with some badass electric fans like spalls. Um, and in that case, I don't know if I would need a push system. Yeah. Because I've already got, it really just comes down to airflow. Yeah. You just need more airflow. And I don't think a push would give me more airflow unless I'm going to the badass fans and the badass fans should give me enough airflow by themselves just by pulling. Just by pulling. Yeah. Um, so uh, the mechanical right now is giving me enough airflow at highway speeds. Just fine. It's just not giving me enough airflow crawling, but it's like just barely not making it. Because crawling around, going up Cadillac, um, going up Rattlesnake Road, um, that was all fine. I think that it just comes down to the really hot days, 90 degrees, temperature, ambient temperature, and crawling with the AC on yeah. is what's impacting it. So I think if I just put a shroud on, I should be fine okay. with the mechanical fan. Yeah. So my goal right now is to create is to find a solution that I know works and then once I get down the road and have an extra $2,000 to spend on fans. Yeah. Right. Then I'll swap that system out for some badass electrical fans. Yeah. Um, but I just want something to stop the engine from overheating that I know I can depend on right now. Right. Absolutely. So you're going to get a three O shroud then? <laughs> Cause it sounds like that three, four isn't going to work. Yeah. I think I'm going to have to take my, the shroud that I had for my electric fan and modify it to have an opening big enough for the mechanical fan um, and um, a, a tube structure to go back to the mechanical fan so that it just pulls everything straight through that shroud and radiator. So I think that's the, what's going to happen right now. Um, I just don't have time to do it. So I dropped the rig off at Dave Pfeiffer's house. Oh, nice. <laughs> and Dave Pfeiffer is currently working on it. Okay. So man, Dave Pfeiffer is pretty much employed by Morflate. He pretty much is. I think he's <laughs> working on 
half of the more flight employees vehicles right now. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I know that's crazy. Yeah. Good for him. He's, He's just a, our staff mechanic. Right yeah, now. <laughs> exactly. You should just have him hire him, Pay him a retainer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, too funny. <laughs> oh man. Nice. <laughs> So that's the update on the Forerunner. That's what I've been up to. Okay. That's me almost dying. Setting up signal. Uh, com- comms mm-hmm. was, went straight forward. Straight forward. I simplified the system this year because um, I know it works. I know that that's a badass location. Um, and I, I didn't have enough time to work on APRS systems for the trail crews. Yeah. Um, and so I just did a simple repeater and that's all we have. We're not running APRS. We're not running multiple repeaters. Um and I did my tests and we were able to get full quieting from base camp in Meadow Lake. Cool. At the low point of where the, essentially where the bar is. Yeah. It's right there next to all those trees. Yep. We had somebody on a handheld, a five watt handheld um, from down there and getting perfect signal Sweet. back to the repeater. So um, should have great comms um, and only people working the event have access to the repeater. So excellent. If you're not working the event, don't ask me for the info. I won't give it to you. <laughs> yes. It's staff only. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Good deal. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, uh, we're already a little long, but I'll, uh, I'll throw some Ireland info out there. Kind of a thing. Yeah. What were some of the high points? Yeah. Just well, the, the quick, the quick high points for everybody that, um, yeah. Fun. Uh, Ireland is a blast. Mm-hmm. It's really easy. Ireland was another really easy trip. I mean, we, uh, like we logistics talked, wise or yeah, all the kind of all the above. Like mm-hmm. I spoke a while, a few years ago about Belize mm-hmm. and how Belize was an absolute easy trip because they even take dollars down there. Uh, okay. You know, so, and they also like the national language is English, you know, and it's not terribly far to fly. Mm-hmm. You fly to like Houston and then you fly down a few hours and you're in Belize. So Ireland was, is also another really easy trip because it, mainly because they also speak English. Mm -hmm. That's easy. You do have to uh, um, change currency because they're on euros. Yeah. And it is a little bit farther of a flight. Mm -hmm. You know, I said earlier, it took us about four or five hours to get across the country. And then it took us another like almost eight hours to get from Atlanta up to Ireland. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a long, there's some long flights in there, but I mean, it's very chill, very relaxed, bat, you know, there. Um, if you're going to drive, they drive on the opposite side of the road. Yeah. You're sitting in the opposite side of the car. Yeah. And we had a manual, so you're shifting with the opposite hand. Yep. Now, the gear pattern for the shifting is the same and the pedals are the same. Mm-hmm. So that, that side at least isn't messing with your brain. Yeah. You didn't have like first gear next to you on the right side of the shifter and sixth yeah, gear on the it, left side yeah, of the shifter absolutely. after reverse all that. But I'll tell you that having the Tacoma being used to the shifting mm-hmm. patterns of the Tacoma and then going into a one through five with the reverse, which is like Bobcats, yep. did mess with me sometimes. Like uh, I wanted to shift into reverse, which on the Tacoma's <laughs> past first gear and up. Yeah. And so I kept going into first and be like, wait, that's not it, you know? <laughs> and then a few times I accidentally tried to shift to sixth gear, which is trying to throw it down into reverse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that yeah. didn't work either. And the car went red on the dash and everything. So that was kind of, yeah, the, the assistant was like, what happened? I was like, eh, we don't have sixth gear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's fun. They love to drink. We like to drink. There's some really cool history in that country is, yeah. that goes really far back. I had no idea. Like, I, you know, Europe in general go is just their history is top notch. You yep. know, they have a whole bunch of stuff, but they had, we went into a temple that was built in 3200 BC. Wow. Yeah. Just like stone <laughs> age yeah. times, you know, they were just coming out. They were just getting out of whatever is before stone age and that like moved over to like understanding tools, mm-hmm. maybe having like a language. Yeah. But you know, we're still using rocks on rocks to create things, Yeah. you know, just starting to farm, Yeah. you know, and they, we went into one of these temples that survived throughout all these years. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you got, you walk in there and you just feel like this is super old and like really kind of special and it's really cool. So that was pretty neat. You know, you drive along the road anywhere and you just go 
you know, sheep everywhere, random ruins everywhere. <laughs> uh-huh. You look to the one side and there's a castle and you look to the other side and there's like a church as big as a castle. Uh-huh. You know, it's, it's pretty cool. Every you know, everybody's speaking English, but they have their funny little accent. Mm-hmm. And once, only once there was somebody that was speaking English and I was speaking English and I couldn't understand him. <laughs> <laughs> and even like later, like at near the end of the night, I was like, man, you are, you are difficult to <laughs> understand. Uh-huh. And he's like, I get that a lot. <laughs> you know, even I, I like, I'll call somebody here in Ireland and they'll be like, what? 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 And he's like, hold on, let me get you with my wife. You know, like <laughs> he has the phone. And she, the wife was like, yeah, he, he's hard. To, I have a heart. Like I couldn't understand him for a first like year of marriage. You know, and I was like, okay, I don't feel so bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, they're a little bit more tech technical advanced on pain than we are here in America. Oh, totally. European payment systems. I love. Yeah. I love the European payment systems. Everything's tap. Yep. Everything's tap mm-hmm. over there, mm-hmm. you know? And so the assistant would use her phone, just pull the phone out, tap, whatever they would just come. There'd be a card of cash and you'd be card and they'd show up and you just tap and you get mm-hmm. to, you know, walk out. No tipping. Fantastic. Yep. You try and tip and they're like, no, I don't want this. Yeah. Like it's, they even, they even go so far as to be like, no, don't tip me. That's weird. Like I'm, yeah. I'm getting paid a livable wage mm-hmm. by my employer. So I don't need tips. Like it felt, it felt <laughs> really weird uh-huh. the first time. Like we went out to dinner and we didn't tip Mm -hmm. and you just feel bad because it's so ingrained Uh kind of into our culture that you would need to leave a tip. Yeah. But they're like, no, don't tip. And so there was a few times that like somebody told us, like, if you got superior service then leave, like leave a Euro or two, Yeah, you know? And so there was a few times that we did that. We Mm -hmm. went to the oldest bar in Ireland. Oh, cool. Sean's bar. Uh, we left that guy a tip because he sat down and the owner of the bar, whoever ran the bar now just sat down and spoke with us for like half an hour, <laughs> just talking about the history, talking about the history of whiskey, talking about uh, like all, all of it. That's cool. You know? And yeah, so that was a lot of fun supposedly. So they argue that whiskey started in Ireland. Okay. Um, they were the first ones that did it though. Distilling spirits wasn't started in Ireland, right? Gotcha. So there was okay. distilling spirits before they sort of turned it into whiskey, which we have today. And mm-hmm. that they were the first ones to kind of do that. Hmm. And, uh, so that was cool. So yeah, that bar was been around since like 900 or something Holy like crap. that. <laughs> yeah. It was super old. That's the, one of the fascinating things that I enjoyed about Ireland was trying to see how far back of dates you can find on stuff. Yeah. Um, cause like we're in California, like our history in California goes back to gold rush. Yeah. It's like, like 1849. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe then, a little bit more, maybe a little bit more, like maybe into the missions. Like, yeah, but it's, it's, we're talking 150, maybe 200 years. Exactly. At, at the most. Yeah. <laughs> and then like, even on the East coast of the United States, we're like going back to the 1700s. Yeah. Maybe 1650s kind sure. of thing. But then you go to Europe and they're talking about 3200 BC, yeah, (laughs) which was 5,000 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. So we went out on a rabbit hole on that, trying to figure out like, what else is this old? Yeah. You know, and it's, there's not a lot. I mean, Mm. there's definitely not a lot. Um, You know, uh, most of it is kind of down in Syria, Turkey, Egypt Mm kind of area. A lot of stuff is that old down there, but not in Europe. Things aren't usually that old. A lot of stuff is like kind of turn of the century, Roman era, you know, some walls, churches made with walls that, you know, have survived time. Yeah. Um, Yeah. There's, there's the history, you know, it's far surpasses America's history. Oh, totally. It's it's, it's quite wild. Though Ireland as a country is newer, younger than the United States. Yep. Yep. Right. They got their independence in like 1950 yeah, or something, something like that, yeah. like around 1960 <laughs> or something. Mm-hmm. I had no idea. Like, we're, I had we're, no history. We're uh, essentially knowledge. step children, step brothers or step, so step, <laughs> step of. kids from Ireland, <laughs> from England. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We both separated kind of from England though. Yeah. They still, uh, what's the, they still hold a grudge. No, they don't <laughs> hold a grudge. They're still part of the British empire, but uh-huh. they're like, Australia. Okay. Right. They're their own country, mm-hmm. but they're still somehow connected with the British power. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, but I had no idea, like the, all the uprisings that happened in like 1912 mm -hmm. and them completely trying to like get independence. And then they eventually did get independence and then they fell into a civil war. Mm -hmm. And then the civil war leader that, that didn't die in, um, during the civil war, where was it? Yeah. During the civil war, I believe it was during the civil war ended up being the president of the country mm -hmm. and he was an American. Oh <laughs> yeah. And so he got captured and then he got thrown in this jail. No, this must've been before that. It must've been during like the revolution time, their revolution time in like mm -hmm. 1912 or 1920s. And, uh, he, they didn't, uh, not suicide. They didn't kill him. They didn't like, uh, what's the, not suicide, murder, murder him or whatever. Mm -hmm. They didn't, you know, uh, cause him to die mm -hmm. because he was an American. And so he was one of the only people that didn't die during that time because they didn't want a conflict with the Americas. Oh, interesting. And so then he <laughs> survived. And then, so he, then once they sort of won, he sort of became the leader. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, he, and he was, he's an Irish descent of, but his parents moved away to America and then he ended up going back, back. for something. And okay. yeah. so I thought that was really interesting. I learned a lot about kind of, it was like Devera, D E V E R A or something like that was his last name. Okay. Um, and he was political power until he almost died in like, or until he died until like the late seventies. Wow. Yeah dealt with world war two and this stuff. And like, mm. and we learned all that information from the jail in Berlin <laughs> because they, <laughs> every revolutionary person eventually went to jail. And so they were able to tell the entire story of like wow. Irish history, um, for Ireland, the country of Ireland yeah. through the jail. Wow. Which was really cool. <laughs> and, uh, and then they've now fixed the jail up and they give tours of the jail. But mm -hmm. for a long time, the jail went into disrepair and they didn't, they weren't cared about until, mm -hmm. uh, somebody came around, uh, like in the late seventies or something like that, or maybe a little earlier and was like, we need to keep these stories alive. Yeah. And did that. So that was fun. Uh, let's see. So that was all Berlin. Berlin's just a big city. It's another big city, but it's still a good time. There's a lot of history there. Uh, we drove across the country, went to Sean's bar, which is like pretty much middle, middle of Ireland, the <laughs> okay. island of Ireland. That's Sean's bar is there in the middle. It's supposedly the oldest bar in Ireland, arguably the oldest bar in the world. Wow. So they, they're kind of like, we can't really like, I wonder if there's a bar in uh, Constantinople that's yeah, older. or something. <laughs> I don't know. They're like, we have no idea. You know, we have documentation that says we were a bar this long ago. Uh -huh. and there's people that say there's bar their bar is older but they don't really have any uh, proof proof yeah. you know or worldwide so they mm -hmm. hold the guinness book of world record for our oldest bar in ireland and wow. then they're like but we we could be the oldest bar in the world yeah. we don't know <laughs> uh we went all the way across the country that was the very first day i drove it was okay. like you got a car sweet we got Go a four country. hour <laughs> road trip <laughs> i'm like okay here we go <laughs> Uh, we drove to the, uh, the coast. Um, a lot of people go to, there's another big city on the East coast, but we were like, nah, like there's nothing really to do there. There's, uh, the Barney stone, which a lot of people are like, did you go there? And we're like, nah, we didn't. Mm. Um, so we just went to the coast, hung out at the coach the, that day. Uh, got it was really like, got into a small town, just relaxed. Yeah. And then we went down to the Dingle Peninsula, which I kept looking for dingleberry shirts, but never found any. <laughs> I was a little I upset. You were talking about that before we left. Yeah. So there was a, yeah, dingle um, peninsula. There's a loop on the dingle peninsula. that's like 25 miles long. And every like five miles, there's a stop to go do something, which is really pretty. We went out and um, went to see a few places where Star Wars, there was some uh, Star Wars videos, uh, mm -hmm. things that happened out on that peninsula. Um. And then there's just a lot of kind of weird history. There's these beehive huts, which aren't, they're called beehives or beehives because they're built like that, but it's, yeah. a, uh, somebody would live inside of it. Mm -hmm. And it's just this weird domed building. Um, we, uh, did as like a Zodiac tour the next day there, which was really cool. Cause they have the, oh, we went to the cliffs of more before that. Um, at when we were up in the beach town, which that's a fairly big area. A lot of people hike to the top of the cliffs some more, but we took a like ferry out and saw it from the ocean. So that was kind of fun. 
And then we did a Zodiac tour down in Dingle and we went to a bunch of uh, weird islands that they shot some Star Wars films on. And then we Mm -hmm. got a tour of their like that bay. And then we were, you're supposed to see dolphins and you're supposed to see puffins. Uh, But we unfortunately didn't see any of those that day. Okay. Yep. Uh, then we went down a little further to the Ring of Kerry, which is about a hundred mile loop. Okay. That um has a whole bunch of history on it, a bunch of churches, a bunch of random cities, um, some really cool old like um what uh, there's some old church and an old castle down there that Queen Elizabeth the second visited back in the day. And they've now fixed it up called like the Muckrose House and Muckrose Abbey. Just really cool. I never knew or never thought about it, but I never realized that Abbey also meant church. So uh, I yeah. kind of learned that. <laughs> okay. Uh, just one of those things like I never put one and two together. Uh-huh. Um, there was, we went out to these other cliffs, the Cliffs of Kerry, and we hiked to the top of those. And we thought those were more impressive than the Cliffs of Moor, but the Cliffs of Moor are more well known. Okay. And so we really liked the cliffs of Cary. Um, there was the Skellic, uh, mountains, which is, or the Skellic islands, which are in episode seven of star Wars. When, uh, Ray finds Luke at the very end of the episode. Oh, yeah. And then on episode eight, where Ray is doing the training uh-huh. on these really weird islands with the bee hub heights. Yep. That's all on the Skellic islands out there. So there was a lot of episodes six, seven, and eight okay. happening on this section of Ireland, which I'd ne- like, I like star Wars. I'm not like a massive star Wars mm-hmm. fan, but it's, you know, when you're there, that's what they talk about. Yeah. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> uh, the next day we stayed in a castle, which nice. was pretty cool. Um, we, we got like a five course meal that night. We had a two or three course <laughs> breakfast the next morning. It was kind of just cool to sit in the castle. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, after that we were really, it's like, okay, our, our trip is a pretty much done and, uh, we're on our way home. And so on the way home, we just stopped at another few other cities on the way back, but it had an absolute blast Nice the entire time. Bar scenes were top notch, uh, <laughs> traditional you had some Irish fun videos. Yeah. Traditional <laughs> Irish music being uh-huh. played everywhere you go. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I asked, you know, I was like talking to the assistant. I'm like, is, do you think the locals like the traditional Irish music or do you think it's a tourist thing Yeah, that, you know, and we've went into a few bars where there was only Irish people uh-huh. and they were playing traditional Irish music. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some old school stuff and new school stuff. So it, we had a, we had a lot of fun. Uh, we'll dive into like more like what we did every day, what yeah. happened and you know, our, some our trips and travels. Yeah. Individual experiences. Only, yeah. uh, maybe once or twice I drove on the wrong side of the road, <laughs> but I? it was only for like split seconds. Cause it, at, you almost immediately realize like, yeah. Oh dang it. I'm on the wrong side. Um, there's a lot like there's a M roads, which is kind of like England, which are like their big interstate roads. So they don't have States. Mm-hmm. They have like counties. So it's their big highways that go across. Then they have N roads, which are like two lane highways. Okay. And then they have R roads, which are like rural roads. <laughs> okay. And man, some, eventually we learn not to take the stay R roads, the R roads. <laughs> not necessarily stay away. Cause sometimes you just have to take it yeah. um, for places you go, but Google, like the fastest route on Google would to be take this M road to this N road to this R road to this N road, you know, like, <laughs> and because the R road will cut a corner, Okay, but the R road isn't faster than staying on an, a highway, uh-huh. you know? So eventually we were like, all right, let's just like look at the map and let's just make sure that we're not hitting the R roads. Yeah. And the R roads, man, they were like, they're 80 kilometers an hour, which I think is like 55 like 50, ish miles yeah. an hour. And it's one lane and, but two directions of traffic. Yeah. <laughs> and there are every like hundred yards, there's sort of a turnout. Yeah. <laughs> and so you're just bombing down this road with blind corners, like vegetation, 15 feet up in the air, Uh like almost no room on either side of you. 
And eventually a car is going to be coming at you. Yeah. Or a bus. Or a bus. (laughs) Or, yeah, some random thing. There was a few. Yeah. I had to back up one or once or twice to make room because there was like three cars (laughs) coming, you know, and there's not enough room for me to pull over. Yeah. And buses or big RVs, Uh you know, out there that I'm like, why are they even on this road? You know, like, and it's just the, the local guy knows it. And you know, there's a stupid American that doesn't know how to pull over when he needs to pull over or something. But that that was fun. I actually had a lot of fun driving on those roads because Uh it's like, I felt like a rally car driver, you know, because it's, (laughs) you know, even if I was only going 50 maybe 40 miles an hour mm-hmm. because you can't go 80 kilometers an hour. Cause it's just but all these hedges are two feet off of either yeah, side of you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I, I told a cabbie at one point when before at the beginning or end, I must've been at the end of the road. I was like, yeah, I was kind of driving by Braille. It's like I would pull over as far as I could until I heard bushes hitting uh, my mirror. Yep. And I was like, that's as far over as I can go. Yeah. Hopefully they're doing the same on the other one. Yeah. So that was fun. I, I had a lot of fun driving. I agree. It, Driving over there was a lot of fun. Yeah. And they all are experienced at it. And I think they kind of realize that there's people out there that aren't nearly as experienced or <laughs> uh-huh. used to that side of the road. Yeah. A lot of signs up saying, drive on the left, drive yeah. on the left, drive on the left, make sure you're holding left. Yeah. So it was fun. Roundabouts <laughs> were a little interesting. Uh, roundabouts aren't like, it's not a foreign concept to me. Mm-hmm. We have roundabouts out here. There's lots of roundabouts where I live. They're like changing stop signs out here mm-hmm. to be roundabouts. Yep. But going through a roundabout clockwise oh, yeah. was just, it's just different, right? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so uh-huh. it's like, you know, you're approaching it and I've got to turn left around the roundabout, not uh-huh. right around a roundabout. Yeah. And so that was just, that was took a quick second, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. We had a fantastic time. We, we drank a lot. We brought a lot of whiskey back. Uh, definitely a, an adult, trip. Mm -hmm. I don't like the mini assistant was a little upset that she wasn't coming with us. She was like, I want to go there. That sounds like fun. It sounds like you can, you know, it's like going to be a good time. Mm -hmm. But nothing that we really did there was, it would have been enjoyable by a child. Yeah. You know, it's very, it's history based. You know, there was a few themes like theme park kind of, there was a fair kind of going on at the same time Uh when we were there. So there was like, we would go to a city and there'd be like a small fair thing happening. And we're like, that's something she would enjoy. But you know, no, if we had the mini assistants, like we really couldn't go out at night, you know, we wouldn't have been going to all the breweries and distilleries Mm -hmm. that we went to, you know, that we would have had to every day figure out something that would be enjoyable for the mini assistants and kind of limit what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So I do think that travel is important for a child, but uh, Ireland, I don't know if I think there's an age, like once they get like 14, 15, start learning some world history, I think then Ireland would be a good spot to go. But yeah. for a 10 year old, I think she would have just been bored the whole time. Yeah. So, but <laughs> yeah, we had a good time. Uh, like I said, we'll do an, we'll do a bonus episode where the assistant and I sit down with some whiskey and we'll, we'll run through the whole entire trip. Sweet. Yeah. I like it. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. That'll be fun. Yep. So cool. Um, that does it for today. So yeah. that's a kind of recap, uh, getting everybody caught up on what Jimmy and I have been up to uh, over the past couple of weeks. So um, if you guys have any feedback for us, shoot us a voicemail. Uh, we do have quite a few voicemails yeah, built back up now. I'm sure we do. So we'll get to those on Friday's segment, Snail Mail, where we listen to voicemails and talk about them and get to converse with you guys in a kind of a one-sided, one-way conversation. Um and then we have the emails, we've got Instagrams, messages, we've got the DMs, uh, all sorts of fun ways to get a hold of us. So you guys know what those are. Um, we've got giveaways going on. We've got a new giveaway for this month for some gear wrench stuff, Yokohama stuff, Onyx stuff. Um, Walter, there's the Walter National one we didn't talk about, but we've talked about in previous episodes. Make sure you guys are doing that. The our side of the Walter National will end at the end of this month, at the end of August. So make sure you guys are doing that if you want in for that giveaway. Um, yeah, man, that's all I got. Sounds good. Any final words for everybody, Jimmy? Slancha. Uh, bless you. <laughs> With that, my friends, keep crawling.
I brought you a book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 365 <laughs> days of dad jokes. We'll just put that in the list of the, or along the line of these uh, 400 and something we got over here. Yeah. I think that was one of the uh, gifts we got at the baby shower. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought that was. I think it was both, it were, both yeah. of them. Were? Yeah. Oh, got I think it. I got both of them. I kept saying dad jokes on the trip with uh -huh. the assistant uh -huh. and uh, she kept telling me that the mini assistant is around. I don't have to tell dad jokes anymore. <laughs> that was after when we visited a cemetery, you know, uh -huh. and I did the classic at one point I did the classic, you know, like, Oh, people are dying to get in there, uh. you know? <laughs> and I was like, oh, what was the other one? I said, Oh, Hey, you want to go, you want to go over there to the cemetery? It doesn't look very busy. It actually looks kind of dead. <laughs> And she's like, oh my gosh, stop it. it. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah, that was pretty fun. Nice.